Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. Read the miracle, recite the Quran. Recite it every day and do read it loud. The verses of Quran are all Muslim's pride. This miracle was revealed over a long time span. Sent from Allah to an angel, then to a man. That man was Muhammad, the best of creation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise be to Allah alone. We praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves astray, none can show him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. After long absence during the blessed month of Ramadan, we've taken off, and now we resume with our beautiful program, Correct Your Recitation. In the beginning, I would like also to welcome our studio guest, Sheikh Hassan, thank you for joining us. Uh, Izzat, Ibrahim, and Ahmed, thank you so much. May Allah bless you all. May Allah accept our good deeds during Ramadan and happy after Eid to all of you and to you brothers and sisters as well. We have a very honorable guest today, mashallah, Sheikh Hassan is excelled in the 10 different dialects and he is Mujazi. He's getting uh, the permission even to give an ijaza to others in the 10 different dialects of the Quran from the University of Al-Azhar, mashallah. And we enjoyed his taraweeh during Ramadan and the night prayer. May Allah bless him and accept from all of us. He's going to be reciting, inshallah, the remaining segment of Surah Muhammad from ayah number 31 uh, through the end of the surah. Then afterward, inshallah, we'll join you back uh, to shed some light on the tafsir of some of these ayat as usual. Please stay tuned. Sheikh Hassan, please proceed on. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولنبلونكم حتى نعلم المجاهدين منكم والصابرين ونبلو أخباركم إن الذين كفروا وصدوا عن سبيل الله وشاقوا الرسول من بعد ما تبين لهم الهدى لن يضر الله شيئا لن يضر الله شيئا وسيحبط أعمالهم يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول ولا تبطلوا أعمالكم إن الذين كفروا وصدوا عن سبيل الله ثم ماتوا وهم كفار فلن يغفر الله لهم فلا تهنوا وتدعوا إلى السلم وأنتم الأعلون والله معكم والله معكم ولن يتركم أعمالكم إنما الحياة الدنيا لعب وله وإن تؤمنوا وتتقوا يؤتكم أجوركم ولا يسألكم أموالكم إن يسألكموها فيحفكم تبخلوا ويخرج أضانكم ها أنتم هؤلاء تدعون لتنفقوا في سبيل الله فمنكم من يبخل فمنكم من يبخل ومن يبخل فإنما يبخل عن نفسه والله الغني وأنتم الفقراء وإن تتولوا يستبدل قوما غيركم ثم لا يكونوا Ma sha Allah, barak Allah, kiki sha Hassan, jazak Allah, khairan. 
Uh, before I begin with the word bank and the tafsir of this beautiful ayat by the end of Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'd like to share with you my thoughts on the new great discovery of the fragments of the most ancient um, copy of or transcript uh, of the Quran. The new discovery of the manuscript in Birmingham University of some Quranic fragments, uh, basically of Surah Taha and some of Surah Kahf uh, as well. Uh, no doubt that Muslims uh, of their different mother tongues, ethnicities all over the world have a very good reason to be excited and to uh, be proud and uh, to show an honor that they have uh, an, an ancient copy, an old fragment of a manuscript of the Quran. As the new discovery says that it goes back to the year 645 uh, after the elevation of Jesus peace be upon him. That is approximately 24 years after the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know what it means? It means it is only 13 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 13 years after the completion of the revelation. Not as many uh, Western Orientalists who claim that the Quran was made or put together like a couple decades after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that the caliphs and the successors of Prophet Muhammad will legitimize their campaigns against other countries and in their invasion. Um, as far as for us Muslims, it did not add any new information to us. I mean, we're so certain that the Quran is the word of Allah and uh, the Quran is all genuine and authentic and the Quran is divinely protected ever since it was revealed and it will remain to be protected until the Day of Judgment. And that is stated in one of the chapters of the Quran in Surah Al-Hijr, Ayah number 9, in which Allah the Almighty says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ In this ayah, uh, Allah the Almighty confirmed by the word inna, which has inna للتوكيد and the alif of the pronoun, which means most surely we have sent down a dhikr, the Qur'an, the reminder. And we here refers to the, um, the royal we. إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا الذِّكْرَ Most surely we have sent down a dhikr al-Qur'an. وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِظُونَ And most surely we shall preserve it. And it is indeed preserved. The effort and the countless attempts to alter or to change the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is done by non-Muslims is no secret. But until today, alhamdulillah, not a single word, not a single letter, not a single vowel of the Qur'an had been changed. What I wanted to say and shed some light uh, on with regards to the new discovery, which for Muslims, nothing new. But it's just, so, just a simple warning, which is that the methodology of determining how old, how ancient, and how genuine is this manuscript uh, scientifically may be different than the Islamic methodology. For us, and we have Sheikh Hassan, mashallah, who have mastered the art of the 10 different dialects. He studied the 10 different dialects of the Quran for over 10 years, mashallah. And he's a scientist too. That we rely mainly in determining whether this piece is genuine, authentic or not, on the following facts, which must be proven. Number one, the continuous testimony of the narration. The continuous testimony. Number two, whom did the transcriber or the writer wrote it or copied it from? Many people think that the Quran was compiled after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu true or false? What do you guys think? The viewers, what do you think? That the statement which says that the Quran was compiled, they are not talking about the revelation. We all believe and in agreement that the Quran was all revealed during the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But we're talking about the compilation of the Quran. Some say that it was compiled after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they say that 
the first person to compile the Quran was Abu Bakr al-Siddiq when Umar al-Khattab suggested that to him and you know the story, true or false? False, I think uh, first uh, was when the Prophet was alive uh, the, the Quran written in like uh, some staff, uh, some uh, crocs. So we yeah, then yeah. have to first define the meaning of compiling the Quran. In what sense? As far as memorizing the Quran, it was all memorized by many of the companions. As you know that in one incident in Bi'r Ma'una, there was 70 Hufad, 70 companions who have mastered all the relations so far. And they were all assassinated. And there were many others, whether during the life of the Prophet ﷺ or after his death, peace be upon him. So as far as compiling the Qur'an in the hearts of the companions, that was accomplished. And it was like, you know, a piece of cake. It was their language. It was easy for them. What about transcribing the, the wahy, the Qur'an? We have authentic references that the Prophet ﷺ used to have, katabat al wahy the transcriber of the Qur'an, whom whenever the Prophet ﷺ would receive any revelation from Allah, initially he would uh, make a serious attempt to memorize it. So he would repeat the Qur'an frequently, the ayat or the verses in front of Jibreel to make sure that he's not missing a word. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assured Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in Surah Al-Qiyamah saying, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به don't you keep moving your tongue swiftly in order to uh, comprehend it or memorize it. That's it. Compiling the Quran and its recitation is due upon us. The Quran will be compiled in your heart. We will make you read it and recite it so that you will not forget a thing of it. Except, إِلَّا ma sha Allah. This is with regards to the abrogation. That's another story. So if Allah wanted to abrogate an ayah or a hukm, he may abrogate the text as well. And accordingly, there is no need to memorize it. So he will make him forget it. But other than that, to forget a part of the revelation in a sense that you completely forget it and you don't have any access to it, that is not going to happen. But as a human being, while reading, while reciting in the prayer, that you may forget an ayah, innocently and temporarily. But afterward, when one of the, the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, this, oh yeah, yeah, thank you, you made me remember it, appreciate it. That's a different forgetfulness, which is temporary. But as far as maintaining the wahi by memorizing the whole text, the Prophet Sallallahu did memorize the entire Quran, and Jibreel السلام, would come to him in every Ramadan and revise the whole revelation up to whatever was revealed. Then in the last Ramadan, which was a sign of departure of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and also the completion of the Wahi, Jibreel السلام, revised the Quran with the Prophet twice. And the hadith showed the process of revising the Quran, that Jibreel السلام, would recite and the Prophet وسلم, would listen. Then the Prophet ﷺ would recite before him what he heard from him while Jibreel is listening until the Prophet ﷺ mastered the whole revelation. Many of the companions, do you call any of the scribes of the Wahy, any of Katabatul Wahy? Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Ubayy ibn Ka'b. Zayd ibn Thabit, of course, will come to talk about him. And Ali ibn Abi Talib. Radiyallahu anhu. Many, many companions, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud too used to have his, okay. So many companions, whenever the Qur'an would be revealed, he would invite one or a couple or more to scribe and write down whatever was revealed to him. So it is maintained in his heart. He memorized it. He invited the companions whenever a verse or verses or a chapter were revealed so that they would listen to it from the Prophet ﷺ and record that in writing. On what? Now we're talking about what? 1450 plus years ago. And this discovery, according to the radiocarbon accelerator unit in Oxford University, it says that it goes back to the year 645, that is the year two, uh, 24 after the migration. Yeah. So 13 years after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, pretty old, very ancient. They used to write it on what? This fragment, they say that it is written against the sheep or the goat skin. 
And this is exactly what they used to write on. And they also used to write on the stones, huge stones. And they used to write on the clavicle bone of a camel. The clavicle bone is very broad. You studied that in anatomy, it's so huge. So when it is right, it's a very good surface that they write with the bamboo, that's called, you know, with the ink pen, and they would write on that, and it remains there. And they would, they would write also on the leaves of the dead palm tree when it dries up, so it's like a leaf. They would write again is that. Now we have, in order to have a Quran, you need a studio like that full of stones and clavicle bones and animal skin for the Quran, which is in the thin, very fine print, 600 papers, you know? <coughs> At the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, when the Muslim Ummah expanded beyond the boundaries and the borders of the peninsula, Umar ibn Khattab suggested to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, we need to compile the Quran. In what sense? Now we answer the very important question, which is, when was the Qur'an compiled first? During the life of the Prophet <laughs> But we need to compile it in one volume. Every year goes by, people get more advanced. Now we can just, uh, you know, when the Ummah prosper, we can just get so many uh, sheep and goat skin, dry it up and tan it, and make uh, one volume of the Qur'an. And this is what they did. So when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq finally agreed, based on the advice of the senior companions and an agreement of the entire Ummah back then, whom did they pick and choose for this task? The Hufaz and Katabatul Wahi, those who were actually interested with recording the Quran and writing. Did he tell Zayd ibn Thabit and uh, these companions to go ahead and write down what they memorized? No. First. No. You need to collect it from two sources, whatever is recorded in writing. Again, it's stones, radical bones, leaves of the palm trees, or animal skin, tan skin, in addition to two witnesses, two hafal, not one. Not for a single ayah you can take one person say, I have memorized this ayah from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No, it's not going to work. I need two hafal. So it is already recorded in writing. And it is memorized by many companions, if not many, at least two. two. And guess what? The scribes themselves, Ar Hufaz, Zayd ibn Thabit, and his assistants, they would not take anything because I know it. It is sufficient. No. So that what makes the Quran so unique for us. Yeah, we're very excited. We're very excited for you, not for us. <laughs> excited that this good news may give you an approach to study the Quran and think about it. In many gatherings, in synagogues, in churches across the United States, as I was attending other interfaith dialogue or approaching people in their places of worship to speak about Islam, I normally raise politely this question. How many different versions of your holy book Wallahi, one day a priest told me that hundreds, maybe thousands, there are too many. <coughs> I said, do you guys know how many different versions of the Quran that Muslims with all the different mother tongues and ethnicities and backgrounds have? Only one. Only one. They were shocked. Yes, they don't know that. We take it for granted because we're Muslims. You know, when you're sitting in the Haram in Ramadan and you see the Quran is... Um, you know, stacked in, in, uh, in, uh, in the bookcases everywhere. And you find one brother or one sister from India, they get up and pick a copy of the Quran and they read. Another Muslim from Russia, and a third from China, a uh, fourth from the US, and an Arab person, and somebody sitting and reciting by the heart. They're all reciting the same Quran. They don't have different versions. One Quran for Chinese, and one Quran for Lebanese, and one Quran for Russians. It's only one Quran. So don't you think that if we as Muslims do not have any reference that Islam is the ultimate truth, and it is the only valid religion, other than this fact, it should be more than sufficient? Yes, indeed. So we are excited for you. Hopefully that will help you to make up your mind. And those who are working day and night and, um, you know, 
exerting tremendous effort and wasting tons of money in order to hinder people from the path of Allah, open up your heart and mind. Loosen up. Accept the truth. Or in Surah Muhammad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Am ala qulubin aqfaluha afala yatadabbaruna al-Qur'ana. Am ala qulubin aqfaluha. Ayah number 24 of Surah Muhammad. When they ponder over the Qur'an, or is it that their hearts have locks upon them? It's a fact in your hands. In the beginning of my comment, I said I want to shed some light and I want to also share with you a serious warning. The serious warning is we don't want to be, um, you know, over delighted and uh, get excited too much and trust some people who are not trustworthy uh, too much. Why? Because in the article which was written about uh, this new discovery, which is an amazing discovery from a scientific point of view, they say um, this discovery supports the view that the text has undergone little or no alteration. You see, there is a little poison in the honey, but this is not a little poison though, it's very poisonous. So I don't want you to be over delighted and think, you know, they're giving you something for free. The meaning of the text has undergone little or no alteration is very toxic. No, the, the, the text has undergone no alteration whatsoever. You know what? If you come up with a new discovery according to the radio um, um, carbon accelerator um, test in Harvard, in Oxford, whatever, and you say that we've come um, to the conclusion that this copy, this fragment, was written by Ali ibn Abi Talib himself, or by Zayd ibn Thabit himself, during the life of the Prophet sallallahu thanks so much, we appreciate your assistance. But you ever say, but there is one word, it is not exactly the same as the Mus'haf that Muslims read today, will say dismissed. We don't want your help. We don't want your assistance. Because those who are sitting in front of you right now, and those who obtain their ijazah, let me speak for instance about Sheikh uh, Hassan. Um, that in order to obtain my ijazah or Sheikh Hassan to get his ijazah, his Sheikh had him recite the entire Quran by heart in front of him from cover to cover. Not just recite it because he memorized it, but to correct the recitation in accordance with the recitation of Jibreel alayhi salam. Are you kidding me? You're saying Jibreel? Yes, I'm saying Jibreel. But we haven't seen Jibreel. We haven't seen Jibreel. I agree. And we haven't seen the Prophet sallallahu either. But the Prophet sallallahu recited the Quran the same way Jibreel recited it before him. And the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, thousands of them, have memorized the Quran from the Prophet ﷺ in the same dialect, in the same way that he recited it, with the different dialects. And they transmitted that to us. So when I look in my ijazah, I find by accident, between me and the Prophet ﷺ, 29 shaykh. Let's call a continuous testimony. The continuous testimony of the narration that my Shaykh recited the Quran before his Shaykh and his Shaykh recited the Quran before his Shaykh until he recited the Quran before one of the companions and this companion recited or heard the Quran from the Prophet Sallallahu who recited the Quran before Jibreel and Jibreel took the Quran from whom? Allah. From Allah. Imagine brothers and sisters, you who make a serious effort to learn the Quran that whenever you obtain this ijazah like the Shaykh in front of us, He's holding a rope. One of its end is in his hand and the other is in the heaven with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're reading what Allah have read. What an honor. That's why in one hadith the Prophet sallallahu says, if somebody was given the honor of memorizing the Quran and he still believes that anyone is luckier than him, then he has belittled Allah's favor upon him. If you give, if you give me a choice, to memorize, to recite, and to understand the Quran or to have a palace immediately, no choice, <laughs> no choice. I don't need to think twice. This is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, we, uh, we are very joyful, we're very delighted, we're very excited and honored, alhamdulillah shukla. But meanwhile, we're very careful because we're not naive. No, we're not naive.
The methodology of determining whether this manuscript, which they will find out today, or maybe tomorrow, and they will ascribe it to one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, because this one most definitely is written by one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, according to the scientific proof. Now for us, alhamdulillah, you see in, um, in the image that we displayed earlier, that the Naskh uh, script, because the script of the uh, is Hijazi. Allah has honored me to learn six different scripts. I can write the Quran in six different scripts, alhamdulillah. And, and I'm ha having actually um, a proof of authenticity of that. So this is a Hijazi script, okay? Not many people will be able to read it, especially the vowels were not available back then. The vowels were made available later on because non-Arab accepted Islam and they couldn't recognize how to pronounce this word. And any error could change the meaning. Anamta, anamtu, anamti. Just a vowel would change the meaning tremendously. So now you see the naskh, the font, the script, naskh, that says exactly the meaning of this Hijaz script. Okay, that is exactly what we read in Surah Taha. Then this is a genuine manuscript. So if the carbon, radiocarbon accelerator the, um, uh, test says that this is a genuine ma ma manuscript, but there is a slight error in it, we'll say sorry, we're not accepting it. This is what I wanted to confirm and share with you brothers and sisters. Muslims have a very unique method of determining what is genuine and what is not. Not only with regards to the Quran, but also with regards to the statements of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why many people feel upset when we say that there is a hadith that many people memorize. Your grandma taught you this hadith. Your great-great-grandfather taught you this hadith. Yasin qalb al-Qur'an. Yasin is the heart of the Qur'an. And many a hadith concerning the virtues of many of the chapters of the Qur'an. You call on and ask for the correct recitation and say, what do you think of this hadith? We look it up. Um, it's not a hadith. Really? How come? My grandpa taught me this hadith, but it is not a hadith. I don't care what your ancestors said. We have a reference. We have a reference. Yeah. Islam is the only religion that Allah the Almighty approves and accepts for his servants. Al-Islam, that's it. And that is in the Quran, which you guys, British, Americans, non-Muslims, Orientalists, have confirmed recently this manuscript is very genuine and it is 1400 years old. It hasn't been changed. I want you to spend a few minutes, not an hour, not a whole day and night, and think about it. Why? And how come? 18% or less of the Muslim population are Arab. And 82 plus are non-Arab. So how come that Arab are minority and non-Arab are vast majority of Muslims? And they stick and adhere to the same manuscript and the same text. This is not something ordinary that we should let it slide. We should think about it. We should ask why. And the answer, you will find it in Surah Al-Hijr, in Ayah number 9. If you still afterward reject the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then blame none but yourself. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Let whoever wills, let him believe. Let whoever wills, let him disbelieve. But this is not an option that is given to you where you're free to choose whatever you want to do without consequences. No. With each choice there comes a consequence. So if you believe, you shall enter paradise. And if you disbelieve, after all, the consequences are severe. Imagine, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَصَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَشَاقُوا الرَّسُولَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْهُدَى لَنْ يَضُرُّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا وَسَيُحْبِطُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ For those who disbelieved and hinder people from the path of Allah and oppose the messenger of Allah after it, the guidance has become very clear to them then they will not hurt Allah in the least, but he will make their deeds fruitful, fruitless, and it will be in vain. May Allah guide us to his straight path and keep us steadfast on his path. Ameen. Uh, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back, inshallah, in a few minutes. If you'd like to join us and start calling in to recite these ayat from ayah number 30 to the end of Surah Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, please stay tuned. Recited every day. 